So we are now recording, so I'll just go ahead and slowly kick things off while people continue to file in. It's just after 1 o'clock. Uh, my name is Casey Filipino I'm with the Hampton Roads Planning District Commission, and this is our. First quarterly water quality technical meeting of 2021. Um, and I appreciate everybody accommodating the, the different. The date shift, but um, this will work out and today um, we're going to be talking about PCBs. We have Dr. Upal Ghosh from the um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County campus, and he conducts research on PCBs and toxics of um, contaminants of concern. Um, and I know that he's been doing some work with local governments. I happen to find him on the internet, but turns out he's also been doing a lot of work related to PCBs with the Elizabeth River Project here in Hampton Roads. So I think this is a really nice fit as we begin kicking off the PCB TMDL process here in the Lower James and Elizabeth River um, to hear a little bit more about the science behind the PCBs, um, just kind of start refreshing our memories on what this is all about. Um, and I will try to, oh, I see. I'll try to address the chat issue. I see that some folks aren't able to chat to everyone, but some are, I'm not really sure why that is, but, um, I um, anyway, I think that's all I have to say. And um, so if you want to go ahead and begin sharing your slides, that'd be great, Dr. Ghosh. Okay. How's that working? That looks good. If you can just put it in a presenter. Yeah. A little small. Well, I think we're looking at the um the notes. It's 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 uh not giving full screen. There, there it is. There it is, there it is, yep. Oh. <laughs> oh, it was well maybe I Changed it too soon. Hey, um, yeah, it's the notes section. It's the notes section, huh? If you go to those three dots there, and that that says hide presenter view, it should show the um, the whole thing. Yep, there we go. Perfect. It's good. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for being able to accommodate the change in the schedule. Um, I, I had a conflict that came up and uh, uh, I had to request moving this to Friday, and I'm, I'm glad um, we are able to do that. Um, I'm very happy to present some of the work that we have been doing over the years, and based on some conversations, I, uh, I thought I'll present this in like a two um, part uh, presentation. So in the first part, I'll talk about pollutant sources and sinks. And I'm getting a little feedback from maybe one of the microphones. Uh, if, you know, maybe, yeah, that's great. I'm, going ahead. I'm just muting lines if that's okay. Okay. So I'm going to, uh, give this as a two part presentation. The first part, I'll talk about pollutant sources and sinks. And this is uh, related to some of the TMDL type efforts that many of you are familiar with, uh, with a little bit of twist, which is focused on pollutant bioavailability. And for the second part, I'll talk about how some of the novel emerging technologies are uh, coming into practice that allows us to address these legacy chemicals. So a big focus is going to be legacy chemicals like PCBs. I'll talk a lot about PCBs because these have been the primary contaminant of concern driving risk at the sites that I have worked. But there are also sites that I have worked where uh, other chemicals that behave similarly to PCBs like dioxins and furans, um, uh, some of the pesticides, PAHs, um, are the driving force for remedy. And 
they all fall under the same category of hydrophobic organic pollutants that tend to be bioaccumulative. And the reason that we are concerned about these chemicals is not so much that they are being used and released by industry or consumers today, but they were released in the past. So these are the legacy chemicals, but they still continue to haunt us because they are very sticky. They are hydrophobic. They don't get flushed out with the water into the sea, but they stay more locally in and often associated with sediments. Uh, they may get carried with suspended sediments and then they deposit in sediments often not very far from where they were released from. So sediment remedy and understanding fate and transport are kind of linked together for the reason that these tend to be sediment associated contaminants to a large extent. But the problem is the, uh, the risk posed by these contaminants primarily come from uptake in living organisms, often in the aquatic food web. And that process is controlled by uh, transport through the water phase. So although oh, these chemicals are hydrophobic, they don't like to be in the water. Water is the medium of transport. And water is the medium through which sediment interacts with the uh, aquatic food web. It's also the medium which um, participates in air water exchange of these chemicals. Some of these chemicals can travel long distances as well as you know. So with that brief introduction, uh, so this is work that we have done over the years. I'm going to focus a lot on the work at Anacostia River. Um, the watershed is shown um, in that inset picture there. Um, so there are several study partners with respect to the work at Anacostia. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, U.S. Geological Survey, University of Maryland College Park, and the D.C. Department of Energy and Environment, which funded this work. And many graduate students and postdocs in my group uh, performed the work. So here is a conceptual picture for PCBs or similar chemicals in an aquatic environment. Human exposure for these chemicals. We don't eat the sediment. We often don't go and drink water from a contaminated river, but we get exposed to these chemicals. And the primary mode of exposure is through the food web. And uh, for PCBs, it's fish consumption. So you are you are probably familiar with fish consumption advisories for fish, and that's the institutional control we try to put in place to reduce that potential exposure to these uh, toxic chemicals. It's a dissolved concentrations of these chemicals, which can be super low, often in nanograms or picograms per liter levels, which drive the exchange between the environmental media and the fish that we, that we eat. And we'll talk a lot more about that as we go along in the slides. So where is this dissolved concentration coming from? It's coming from legacy sediments that are contaminated. So these are the bed sediments that can be contaminated in the past and continue to release these chemicals into the water column, even though the water itself may be cleaner today than it was in the past. So we get this historical release uh, uh, deposits that are releasing chemicals and making them present problems. And then we continue to have inputs from tributaries and outfalls into these rivers in an urban system. And this is more important in an urban system where the terrestrial landscape is not clean. So every time it rains, the city gets a wash and that wash water goes down. We, we basically have not been able to put into, control, um, into place control systems for the massive amount of water that comes out after a storm. And that basically goes through st the storm drain system into these rivers. And often if it's washing down maybe a old junkyard or a metal recycling facility or a transformer yard, which has PCBs on the surface soil, those PCBs will get washed down into the river or into the tributaries that ultimately go into the river. And then um, air water exchange can be an important part. You get a large surface of water that is exchanging with the air phase. And depending on what the concentration differences are, 
it's really chemical activity difference between the air phase and the water phase that would then dictate which way and what magnitude that transfer would uh, uh, take place. So these ongoing inputs are often difficult to characterize. So um, oftentimes the sediments which are much easier to characterize are the, are the most well-defined medium in the environment. And oftentimes we um, attribute most of the problems to sediments but it's important to look at the full picture like you have in this picture here. There is contribution from sediments going into the water column, contaminating the phytoplankton and the zooplankton and the food web and, and the fish. And there can also be inputs from upstream, inputs from tributaries that are contaminated, combined sewer overflows and air water exchange. All of this has to be put into perspective in determining what is the role of sediments? And this becomes really important at sites where maybe millions or hundreds of millions or billions of dollars are, um, be, are at stake in terms of uh, cleaning up. And one needs to have a good quantitative understanding of these inputs. Is the sediment 90% of the problem or is it 10% of the problem? And that is often very difficult to define without a good mass balance. In the end, it's all about accounting and using the right metric for accounting and being able to account for all of these input and output processes. Um, so, we, so the other thing that is important for these chemicals is making the distinction between what is bound up in solids and what's uh, freely available in the water phase. And these two components can have very different impacts in terms of the water quality. So if PCBs come attached to sediments and deposit them into the sediment bed at concentrations that are lower than what's already in the bed, then it's going to be of less impact. Whereas the dissolved concentrations would be picked up by the phytoplankton and the food web more readily and can have a much larger impact. So making a distinction between in this loading calculations what the dissolved component is and what the, what the particle associated component is, is an important part of getting the full picture of risk. And you know, oftentimes in the TMDL approach, it's been the total load that is looked at, which often um, is not able to appreciate or be able to identify inputs that are of bigger concern in terms of uptake into the food web which is the dissolved concentrations. So paying attention to what's the dissolved fraction and what's the particle associated fraction can be, um, can have a major impact for hydrophobic pollutants like PCBs. So with that context, let's get into uh, the work that we did uh, at the Anacostia River. So uh, if I go back here, measuring water concentrations for these pollutants are dissolved concentrations in the water is really tricky because we're looking at sub nanograms per liter levels. So if I take a liter of water from that river and send it to an analytical lab, they'll have trouble measuring that. Oftentimes we have to, we have to sample like hundred liters, pass it through a filter, absorb the chemicals in a little cartridge and send that cartridge to the lab for analysis. Another approach that has emerged with some of the research that we have done in the last decade or so in my lab and several other labs in, in uh, the US and Europe is called passive sampling, which involves placing a well characterized sheet of polymer that has a strong sorption capacity for these chemicals in the water for a period of time. So I leave it in that water column or in the sediments in, to sample the pore water, or in the air above the water to exchange with the air, I can get a measure of that dissolved concentration or the gas phase concentration based on my knowledge of partitioning of those chemicals into the polymer from the water phase or the gas phase. And that's very valuable because these polymer sheets that we use um, would if I put out a gram of that polymer, that will be equivalent to sampling like a thousand liters of water because it absorbs these chemicals very strongly. 
and comes to an equilibrium with the ambient conditions over a period of time. So the benefits are two. One is it samples at high enough concentration that is equivalent to 100 to 1000 liters of water. And it does that in a time integrated way over a month or more. Oftentimes you put it out for two to three months. So I can get a, a signal that averages the concentration for say a summer period or a fall period. And that's very valuable because if you think about the fish, it's not responding to a time point in concentration spike or time point in concentration drop in the water column. But what we get in the fish is the experience of the fish in sampling that water over its lifespan. So longer time period integration of that value is is much more meaningful in terms of getting a sense of the average inputs and outputs in that system. So the sampling method basically involves using these passive samplers. So these are you know, uh, basically a sheet of polymer. And the most common one that is used is good old uh, polyethylene. So this is low density polyethylene sheet that uh, uh, maybe about 25 microns in thickness. And um, we would put out maybe about a gram of that polymer. And there are different ways we put it in. Um, so in this case, in a shallow tributary on the in the picture in the bottom left, we put it in a stainless steel mesh and then insert it in the gaps um, inside this hollow cinder block. And then you can leave the cinder block on the bed of the sediment, allowing the water to pass through the holes in the cinder block where the sampler is. And you see uh, students putting those samplers in this, in this tributary here in the Anacostia River. So this is the state of the art in monitoring dissolved concentrations of hydrophobic chemicals like PCBs, where the concentration is very small, but we still need to get an accurate measurement of that. And we also use what's called performance reference compounds to make sure we understand whether or not that equilibrium has been achieved. If not, we can correct for it. These polymers can also be put in the air phase to get a uh, measurement of gas phase concentrations of these chemicals. So on the top right, there are these two nested stainless steel bowls. And inside the bowl, we have the polyethylene passive sampler. So the top bowl is protecting it from direct deposit, deposition of rain and dust, but air is allowed to pass through it. And this is uh, on top of a um, school that we placed in, um, in the DC area. And it allowed us to sample the average gas phase concentrations of PCBs over um, three month period. So these methods have been developed in the research labs. And then several of these research labs, including ours, we came together uh, with EPA to develop um, a user manual. We are in the process of developing a e US EPA standard method for uh, these passive samplers. But for now, most people are following this uh, document that I have on the bottom right corner um, where EPA participated and we came up with uh, this manual which describes how the work is done for passive sampling. So with that, I'm going to go to the next uh, a few slides that will show some of these results. So the uh, sampling points, uh, if you're familiar with Washington DC, the yellow region is the DC region. And this was funded by DC Department of Energy and Environment. So primary focus was the within the boundary of Washington DC. And uh, we put several of these samplers in the main river channel and also in uh, several of these tributaries that were potentially of concern. And the goal was to try and understand all these inputs and outputs of the river, uh, focusing on the main tributaries, uh, looking at gas phase to water phase exchange, and also sediment to water exchange, and characterizing those and getting a quantitative sense of what those relative amounts were. So um, our background site was Zekaya Swamp. It's further down in Maryland. And the first bar on this figure is our sampler deployed in this background location. We get very low concentrations there. 
So just to uh, make sure everyone is on the same page here, these are total PCBs in the water. So this is freely dissolved PCBs in the water and the concentration units on the Y axis um, is nanograms per liter. So this is for all the PCB congeners. So we measure about 100 or so PCB congeners, add them up and that's the total. And um, in the bottom, what uh, are these sampling locations, starting with Zakaya Swamp, which is a background location. NEB and NWB are Northeast branch and Northwest branch. These are the two main branches or tributaries um, bringing the ma uh, majority of the flow into the Anacostia River. Um, and then we have uh, several of these uh, tributaries, uh, Hickey Run, Watch Branch, LBC is Lower Beaver Dam Creek. And then we have uh, the last two points are the two locations within the main channel of the river in the lower Anacostia River. I have two uh, dashed lines. The red dashed line is 10 plus to minus five cancer risk for PCBs. And um, that's 0 0.6 nanograms per liter. So that's a, that's a number that uh, comes from the water, uh, ambient water quality criteria for PCBs in water from EPA. Above that, you end up accumulating enough in the fish to cause concern at a level of 10 in a million incremental cancer. The black dash line is uh, one in a million cancer risk, which is a lower number by a factor of 10. So what you can see is the river itself, ARK and AR0, those are two locations in the main channel of the river. The total concentrations are above uh, that 10 in a million cancer risk for PCBs. And that's the reason we have fish consumption advisories in the river, but it's not higher by a whole lot. It's about a factor of two or so. Um, and what you can also see is most of the tributaries are bringing in relatively clean water compared to what's in the river. So the main two tributaries, Northeast Branch and Northwest Branch, the uh, dissolved concentrations of PCBs are super low, lower than what's in the river itself. So those don't have to be the target for any management action. Whereas LBC one and two, those are two locations um, upstream and downstream within the lower Beaver Dam Creek, one creek that's bringing in much smaller volume of water, but much higher concentrations of PCBs in the dissolved phase. And corresponding the suspended solid phase PCBs were also very high. So with, with just looking at passive sampling integrated values across the tributaries and the river itself, and compared with the background and some of these risk criteria, one can easily point out which tributary one should go after to make a difference in terms of inputs coming into the river. So, so right now, um, uh, DOEE in collaboration with uh, Maryland Department of Environment is going further up in the Lower Beaver Dam Creek to figure out what the sources are. Is it the sediments in the creek or is it uh, some land use within that watershed of the creek itself that's causing the problem. So our work was able to narrow down uh, the scope of further investigation and the primary source of ongoing input into the river that needs to be controlled. So that's a picture of the different uh, tributary inputs into the river. Um, we also looked at uh, over time what's happening in the uh, different locations in the Anacostia River. There are some changes that happen over time. Um, some of the numbers uh, change, but they are kind of within the factor of two. They don't change a whole lot, except when we come closer to some of the contaminated sediment sites. And the, the highest bar you see is close to a contaminated sediment site where the water column concentration is responding to some extent to the local conditions there. Um, Let's see, we, in addition to looking at the water column concentration across the tributaries um, in different seasons, we also, which is the middle plot here, we also did two other things. We looked at dissolved concentrations in the sediment pore water. So if sediments are contaminated at a site, 
the water that's in between particles in the sediment, which is called the sediment pore water, will also be high. And it's, it's an important measurement to look at comparing the dissolved concentration in the sediment pore water to the freely dissolved concentration in the overlying water, because that gives you a sense of whether the sediment there is acting as a sink or a source. If the concentrations in the sediment pore water is higher than the surface water, you'll have diffusive exchange, which will be in the direction of sediment to the water. So the sediments will be acting as a source. If the sediment pore water concentrations of freely dissolved PCBs are lower than the surface water, then you'll get a reverse of uh, that, where the sediments are actually acting as a sink for the PCBs. And you cannot tell that from just looking at the total concentration in the sediment, you have to look at the dissolved concentration in the pore water, which controls that diffusive exchange between these two phases. So if you look at the bottom figure, those pore water concentrations at each of those locations in the tributaries, they correspond to what we see in the surface water. So these, um, the, the sediment is acting in concert with what's happening in the water column. And in most of these places where the higher concentrations are noted, those pore water concentrations you can see are higher than the surface water concentration. So the pore water is acting as a source into the water column. We also deployed freshwater mussels, and this was done in collaboration with Fish and Wildlife. And we see kind of a correspondence to the water column concentrations because these mussels are heavy ventilators of surface water. So they exchange with the surface water a lot and they respond to what's happening in the surface water in terms of concentrations. So, uh, so I'll go to the next slide here. Um, a couple of important things to note here. Um, one of the big, uh, uh, you know, in addition to identifying these, the, the, the uh, primary input that's causing high concentrations in, in, in the Anacostia River, we are also able to look at um, the contribution of suspended sediments that are coming down these rivers. One of the big concerns is sediments coming from the tributaries that's uh, causing deposition in the river. And if we see concentrations of PCBs in the sediments, we often attribute that to sediments. And then uh, uh, conclusion from that often is that if we cut down the sources of sediments coming into the river, because PCBs are associated with sediments will make a big difference. It will, will improve the conditions in the river. The problem is one has to look at the concentration in the sediments, suspended sediments that's coming in and compare those with concentrations of sediments that are already in the surface sediments in the river. So we found some very interesting things here in the Anacostia system where, um, so let me show you, uh, orient you what's here on this figure first. Uh, PCBs in sediments, suspended or bedded sediments in uh, micrograms per kilogram. So those are the concentrations in sediments um, in the y-axis. The green bars are locations, are uh, different locations in the Anacostia main uh, river that were sampled. So these are surface sediments, top six centimeters, uh, top six inches. And those green bars represent the total concentrations of PCBs in those, in those uh, sediments. What we found was that the sediments coming down from these tributaries are generally at the lower end of these concentrations that are already there in the sediments. And the blue bars are estimated concentrations in suspended sediments during base flow. So this is due, not during the storm flow, during the base flow, and during the base flow, what you have, you have a lot of organic matter and uh, much less of sandy sediments in the water column. But the little orange bars that you see, which you basically cannot even see for Northeast and Northwest branches, the first two sets of bars, are the suspended sediment PCB concentrations during storm flow. These were measured by the US Geological Survey. So the storm sediments have concentrations that are super low, even in LBC1. You remember LBC, the lower Beaver Dam Creek had the highest concentrations uh, of PCBs in the water, dissolved PCBs in the water. Even that tributary has super low suspended sediment concentrations. 
So these storm sediments are not a problem. So the storm sediments, in fact, are helping clean up the river, which is somewhat counterintuitive because one would initially think that sediments are where PCBs associate with. And if you, if you stop the sediment problem, you'll solve this PCB problem. Not so in this case. If we actually stop the sediment problem, which is often the goal of sediment TMDLs, you actually reduce the rate at which natural attenuation happens in this system. So these, the river where it's question. already contaminated. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, it's I just this is this is really interesting, and I I just want a, a clarification on what a storm flow sediment is. Is that something that would have been, you know, I think about storm flow, it would have been something potentially washed off the landscape and or something that was stirred up during a storm, right? So is right, so a mix. So so yes, it's a mix. Um, and these are, remember, these are concentrations measured either in the river or in the tributary itself. So if it is resuspending, it's resuspending within the tributary and coming down into the river. So it's a combination of the two. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's a combination of uh, landscape. It's a combination of riverbank erosion, um, sediment resuspension within the bed, all kinds of things, yes. But you know, you you get my point here that you know the sediments coming down during the storm, which is maybe ninety percent of the sediment budget into the river, is actually not causing a PCB problem in the river. It's important to 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 note that, and that may not be true for every river, but at least for Anacostia, typical urban river, that's that's what we are seeing. Um, let me move to the next slide here. Um, so I'm trying to give you a snapshot of a large uh, project that we did, and I'm happy to provide more information. And I sent uh, uh, I, you know, the, 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 the final report of this work is also uh, publicly available at the DOE site that I can uh, provide a link to, which has a lot more background and description than I can cover in the 30 or 40 minutes that I'm planning to present. I'm already around 30 minutes. Um, uh, uh, the other thing we did was to look at this flux between the sediment and the water column because we had four water concentrations in sediments and surface water concentrations, both in comparing apples to apples because we're looking at freely dissolved concentrations. Look at what concentration in sediments this switchover happens from sediments becoming a problem to sediments be becoming uh, uh, not a problem. That is, is the sediment source of PCBs through the water column? or is the sediment a sink of PCBs into the, into the water column. So, um, so if you look at the plot here, this is looking at the flux, um, sediment to water PCB flux. And the bottom is concentrations in sediment. This is some of these 119 congeners we are following. So at the high end of the concentration in sediment, when you have about 696 micrograms per kilogram in sediments, we have a big flux so sediments are a source through the water column. As you look at lower and lower concentration, we get a switchover that happens at about 200 nanograms per liter, uh, nanograms per kilogram. So at 200, sorry, 200 micrograms per kilogram. So at 200 micrograms per kilogram PCBs in sediments, if you are above that, the sediments are a source through the water column. If you are below that, you are a, sediment is actually acting as a sink from the water column. And that's important in terms of framing the decisions on what sediments are hot enough that needs to be cleaned up. And the guidance that came from uh, uh, in, in the, in the uh, uh, RI report is also around that 200 number. And this, this helps frame this question of whether sediments are the problem or not the problem in terms of PCBs. So, the over, so here is the overall mass balance that we have thus far. It has picked up most of the inputs. There are a few unknowns. Some of the MS4s and CSOs are unknowns. We don't know how much PCBs associated dust falls into the river. Typically, that's a very small number, so we haven't spent too much effort figuring that out. And there are two numbers that you'll see in some of these blocks. One is the freely dissolved number. The other is the total load. So if you look at the total load from Northeast and Northwest, these are the two main branches of the river, 88 grams per year of PCBs coming in. 
But if you look at the freely dissolved, it's really small, seven or eight grams per, per year. Lower Beaver Dam Creek, the one that I have uh, highlighted in red here, is the biggest contributor of both freely dissolved and the total load. So that was important to see in the context of, uh, uh, in, you know, in quantitatively, what these loads are for these different tributaries. And the other tributaries are Hickey and Watts Branch are really small compared to the Lower Beaver Dam Creek. So much attention is now getting focused on trying to clean up what's happening in the Lower Beaver Dam Creek. Uh, there are some sediments in the bottom that are acting as source, but large majority of the sediments are actually sinks of PCBs. And remember that cutoff is about 200 ppb, where sediments are acting as a sink or a source. A major, majority of uh, the PCBs are flowing down into the Potomac River and into the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, some, and that's a quite a quite a significant, some 177 grams per per year is volatilizing into the air. So before we did the study, there were, pe there were people in two camps. Some believe PC, uh, the air was actually contributing to the PCB problem in the river, but there, was, there were no numbers. So you have to have these numbers to get a, even a s direction on the arrow in the conceptual site model, which way these PCBs are going. And, and then with, lot, with a little more detailed analysis, you can put numbers to these arrows, like what we tried to do here. And that puts a picture in mind that can allow then one to think about targeting the, with management options, the, the major sources um, of problem. Um, so I'm going to quick, I kind of went through these conclusions. So I'm going to quickly move over to the next. This is from US EPA directive, control sources early for sediments. That's the first thing, have to control the sources early and ensure that the sediment cleanup levels are clearly tied to risk management goals, that it actually addresses the risk, the real risk. Um, I am going to make a switch to some of the rem uh, remedial options that I talked about. So the key recommendation from this work was you need to couple uh, with, a uh, with a food web model to, to link these media concentrations into fish. Um, and I'm, I think I'm going to skip that and go into the in-situ treatment options. So we also did the mass balance uh, modeling, which is coupled to the food web model to allow us to um, have predictive capability where if we said that we are going to cut out some load, what's, how is that going to impact the concentrations in the fish? So to do that, you have to link it with a model. And I'll just give you a structure of this model. Um, if, if we can characterize what the fish does in the river, what it eats, what it breathes, and how much, we can model uptake into the fish. And once we have these concentrations measured, we can fit into the model. Uh, the complexity comes from the fact that it's not a single fish, but it's really a food web. So we developed a food web model for Anacostia River, where we feed in these inputs to, and they are linked to each other. Um, once we have this set up, then I can change concentrations in sediment or the pore water or surface water, and that will propagate through the food web and give me concentrations in striped bass that I'm interested in. So that's what we are working on, and we have some initial results. I'm going to skip through that and go into uh, in situ treatment. So as I as I as I uh, uh, explained earlier, um, a big uh, uh, contributor to PCBs in the water column can be hotspots and sediments. And then the question is, what do you do about these hotspots that are fluxing PCBs into the water column, causing problems, and also impacting uh, the uh, uh, the uh, benthic community that's that lives in the sediments and serves as food to many of the fish species in the in the in the water column. We have been working on two different approaches for that. So these um, these contaminant sediments naturally go through attenuation processes. So there are chemical transformations that happen in the sediments. Some of these are biological processes that degrade these chemicals that we can take advantage of. And there are also processes which bind up these chemicals strongly in the sediments that reduces the availability to organisms. And there are ways to enhance that in sediments. So we can think about this as enhanced monitored natural recovery where we are working with nature to enhance some of the processes that reduce 
the chemical activity of these chemicals reduce the bioptic into the food chain. So we have done some research over the last decade or so looking at enhanced sequestration of PCBs in sediments. And then coupled with that, for PCBs, we have developed ways to add microorganisms that degrade PCBs along with the sequestration. So I'll talk about some of that work in the next few slides before I take questions. So th this is the conceptual picture. We, if we can put these amendments into sediments that either bind up the pollutants, making it less available to the food web, or in addition to doing that, it degrades these pollutants in the sediments, we have now a way to reduce the impact from these contaminated sediment hotspots. So it, the early work started in the lab and the, in, in aquaria with fish and looking at how if we add amendments into sediments, it reduces the uptake into the fish. So uh, the red bars here are water, uh, water column PCB concentrations on the left and on the right are PCB concentrations in the lipid phase of the zebra fish that we use as a model. And the treatment in this case involves adding 4% activated carbon into the top layer of sediments. So the sediment layer, which is contaminated with PCBs, we're amending with a very strong adsorbent activated carbon at a, at a low dose, about 4% in this case. And what we see is that when we do that, PCBs get absorbed, doesn't, the pore water concentrations drop by more than an order of magnitude. And when the pore water concentrations drop, they don't go into the water column anymore. 95% reduction of water column concentrations after amending with the activated carbon. And how does that translate to concentrations in the fish? In this case, with the zebra fish, this amendment reduced the uptake in the zebra fish by 87%. So that's great. If we can reduce those kinds of, achieve those kinds of reductions, we now have a way to reduce the impact without having to remove those sediments and putting it somewhere else. Um, so we have, uh, we have published this work. There are multiple papers that have been published. I, I can uh, point you to those. And US EPA also looked at some of these demonstrations we have done in the field and came up with this directive in 2013 that talks about use of amendments for in-situ treatment. That's a, that's a nice guide for this technology. Um, I'm going, going to quickly go into uh, uh, some uh, work that we have done. It's great we can do it in the, in an aquarium, how do we take it out into the field? So this was an EPA small business innovative research project that I did several years ago. And the picture on the right is Fort Eustis, not far from where many of you are, where we did our first demonstration through uh, uh, National Institutes of uh, 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 Environmental Health Sciences funded studies. So this NIH study allowed us to demonstrate this in the field. So we package these activated carbon into pellets. You see in the top there, they're like rabbit food. Um, it's basically activated carbon, clay, and sand. It makes these pellets hard enough and dense enough to fall through the water column. You can disperse it using a whole variety of um, dispersion, uh, dis dispersion mechanisms. And then in the sediments, they, the clay softens and releases the carbon, which gets blended into the surface through biological activity. Like you see there in the picture on the right, we put some fluorescent dye into these pellets and you can see the warm burrows um, acting as conduits for these carbon amendments getting into the bioactive zone. So we did many pilot studies uh, and this is a study that we, this is not a study, it's actually a full scale uh, application in a five acre lake in Dover done by the uh, Delaware Department of Natural Resources. So it's scaling up um, and you can see the telebelt applying the activated carbon into this lake system. And the core shows the top four inches or so is where the carbon is after a few months. The goal was to reduce PCB concentrations in fish in that lake. This lake is part of a um, uh, uh, tidal um, river system. And you see these two fish in the middle, the bluegill and the uh, brown bullhead those showed concentration reductions of 70% after about three years of application. Whereas the perch at the herring, which are migratory fish, which are spending very little time in the lake itself, show hardly any change. So the ambient concentrations are not changing, but within the lake, 
concentrations dropped of PC available PCBs. So the resident fish showed big improvements. Um, we added to this technology bio amendments. So my, my collaborator, Kevin Sowers, who is a microbiologist has isolated and developed these organisms that can degrade PCBs in the environment. So we can add those amendments as biofilms on these carbon pellets as they go down into the sediment. So the carbon pellets are actually acting as a delivery system for these microorganisms. So we found in our research that the biggest obstacle in these microorganisms is their growth. The concentrations in sediments are so low that these organisms cannot grow to large enough numbers to make a difference. So we isolate those organisms in the lab reactors. We grow them into much larger numbers. And then if we back, add them back into the field, they seem to do the work. So uh, this is, these are two pictures on the left. One is in uh, Quantico uh, Marine Corps base, just south of DC, where we did a pilot study for the Department of Defense. And the picture below that is a site that we were doing for Navy. We are doing for Navy this week. So I was out there um, early part of this week um, to help with that application. And this was a much larger system treating a much larger area. So the carbon particles pellets are going in with the, with the biometrics. And in the uh, Quantico study, we saw 62 and eight, uh, sorry, 84 and 95% reduction with the bio amendments and 62% reduction with just the carbon. We did a much smaller dose of carbon to really look at uh, the focus was the bio amendments. So I'm going to uh, end here with this conclusion These, uh, the, uh, for the, for the in-situ treatment work, the pollutant bioavailability in sediments can be controlled by amending with activated carbon. We can do a little better with bio amendments that can degrade the PCBs over time. So it enhances these natural processes of sequestration and uh, biodegradation and seems to be working in the field. So very excited about that. So I'm going to stop here uh, with some acknowledgements to a whole uh, range of people that uh, I've had the pleasure to work with and many collaborators and funding sources that made it possible. Happy to take questions. I'm sure. Sorry, I went over time here. Uh, no, this was great. I I have a big billion questions, but I'm gonna see if others want to do that first because I just I mean I learned a lot, and um, I think that was the key. Um, so I'm gonna open the floor. Um, please feel free to um, uh, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Anybody? I've got a couple. <laughs> Thanks, Barb. <laughs> off. Um, I, I like you. That was a really, really interesting, um, fascinating, actually. And a uh, couple questions I had. Um, first, I, I thought the the sediment work was really interesting. How some sediments actually help, and then the deposited sediments, you know, or a sink. Did, do you know if there's any difference in the particle size um, that impacts that ability to either help or not? Or did, yeah. or did you go there? Yeah, so I think that's a, that's a really good question. So what happens in, if you're thinking about the storm sediments, we get larger particle size during a storm because you need higher energy to mobilize larger particles. Right. And these larger particles, and once you are getting into fine and coarse sand uh, size range, they have uh, less PCBs because um, it's a fine grain organic rich material that PCBs and other hydrophobic chemicals like to bind to. So just from the particle size, um, these higher particle size material that gets mobilized more in the storms have less contaminants. Okay. The other other thing that happens is in addition to that, you get a you have a very large volume of water that's mobilizing it. And it's mostly fresh water. So there is a dilution of the water. And then there is this dilution with uh, coarser particles that have less PCBs. So the net effect is during the storms if you look at suspended sediment concentration, uh, PCB concentrations in the suspended sediments, you get super low concentrations. Hmm. 
and it's it's partly because of what you just said that it's the coarse sediments that get mobilized which don't bind these particles these these pollutants as much and then I'll, I have one other question and I'll turn it over to whoever else. Um, so the, uh, about the activated carbon treatment, um, is, the, is there any impact to the existing benthic organisms? And then does it just break down over time and kind of um, incorporate with the, the native sediment or does it have to? What happens to it over time? I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think uh, um, so. So the carbon, the activated carbon itself, is a graphitic form of carbon. It doesn't degrade away, so it'll stay there, and continue to absorb, and retain the PCBs. The conceptual idea is that we lay this uh, uh, layer of carbon which integrates with the bioactive zone, typically four to six inches. And over time, new sediments, the cleaner sediments that are depositing over time, because we have theoretically control of the sources, pushes that layer down in, in, the, in the sediment horizon. So if you come, and we actually did this, we came back 10 years later and we find that our carbon treated layer is 15 centimeters below a dep deposition of new sediments that happened out over time, and hmm. the new sediments are cleaner. So what happens is as, as the deposition happens over a long period of time, the layer that was deposited, which was the carbon layer, continues to act as a barrier layer between the contaminant sediments and the new cleaner sediments. Oh, okay. So you leave that in place as a barrier layer that will stay forever. Um, so, you know, one of one of the things we has to one has to be careful about is that the the sites where you might like to do that is not prone to heavy erosion that washes that material away. But even if it washes moves somewhere else, it's going PCBs are going to be bound to the carbon and less available. But theoretically, theoretically, you should uh, we like to do it at sites which are net depositional sites, wetlands and so forth, where sediments deposit over time and bury it. Okay. I forgot the first part of your question, though. I think. Um, I just was wondering if, when you put the, the carbon down, if it has an impact on the benthic, benthic community. community. Yeah. So we or, and or others have done. Or... That that's a very good question. So people have done many studies. We have done in the lab in the field. So as you go into higher doses of carbon above 5%, you start seeing some non-lethal effects of growth because it's, it's you are starting to change the substrate to look different. But largely uh, the conclusion is that uh, the benthic community uh, uh, are minimally impacted, especially after you, if you look at it after two, three years when new sediments have deposited on top. So I think it's a beautiful review. I can, I can, I can uh, on that subject that I'm happy to um, uh, share with you. Thank you, and that was a great presentation. Thanks for sharing your work. Uh, I work for the city of Chesapeake here in Virginia. So, thanks. Thanks. Hey, hey Barb. This is uh, Joe Rieger. Um, I was just going to mention that we're going to be doing a large scale application of this material in Paradise Creek in the fall and then we've also identified in chesapeake scuffletown creek as potentially the next um, site we would want to do so we can give you updates on we have a bunch of pre-monitoring data before we've applied the material and we're going to have a ton of data after we apply it and so we'd be happy to share this with the group because i think this may come into play with the pcb tmdl and potential other applications of this type of product in the region. Thanks. I, yeah, I'd be real interested in that. Good to know. Um, any other questions? Because I can go on, I can ask one. <laughs> hey, this is Jim Milliken with the City of Virginia Beach. I also thought this was a great presentation. Um, I, I just wanted to make sure I understood something correctly was um, you mentioned that it's, uh, I guess, after you put down the activated carbon layer, 
that um, I, I guess a cleaner sediment will will come in and and kind of fill on top of it. Uh, so is, is this dependent upon um, identifying all of the PCB sources further upstream? I, I mean, what's the impact of if if you don't have all of your sources upstream identified and and some of those uh, I don't know if sediments are still coming in that are uh, with higher concentrations of PCB? No, this is this is absolutely a great question. So, you know, you can imagine that any kind of sediment remedy is going to be impacted by the new sediment layer that's going to be forming over it. So if you dredge it, if you cap it, if you do in situ treatment, um, none of this, none of that would survive an onslaught of new contaminant sediment that comes and deposits and forms a new layer. Um, so that you know that is the first thing, and that's why you know I I I, I had a one slide where I showed the EPA directive that says number one is control sources early. Um, so that's that's absolutely important. And if you have carbon in the surface layer, it will it will probably take some onslaught of new PCBs, but it depends on whether it's a lot coming in and that overwhelms the system. So you know you point to a really important challenge, which is to identify the sources and make sure that the new sediments that are depositing are going to be acceptable sediments because no matter what you do, that's going to be the new substrate in that river or water body. Right, thank you. Oh, I, I had one other follow-up question too, is if you were to dredge this material out, would is there any after effects of it, you know, stirring it up where any PCB would be re-released into the water or, or would it pretty much stick in the, the sediment once we dredge it up? No, it actually will be much better. I mean, I have a new project. I'm, I just started this year with the uh, port administration here in Baltimore, where they want to look at the idea of uh, amending carbon into their sediments as they are being dredged as a way to sequester the PCBs in the process of uh, hydraulic dredging so that the material that comes out of the pipe in the other end is already amended with carbon with reduced potential impact that can even be used for shoreline restoration efforts. So it actually helps by cutting down the water column concentrations that will result from that material. People also look at using carbon in one of the projects where they're doing dredging. But as you know, with dredging, you have to deal with residuals. You don't get everything. As the clamshell mm -hmm. bucket comes up, it drips a, a, a few percentage of what it picks up back into the river, which goes back to the bottom. And then people are looking at adding the carbon to manage the impacts from those residuals. So there are different ways to think about it. But by capturing the PCBs strongly into that solid phase, it reduces your water quality problems. Right. Thank you very much. It's very interesting. Hey, this is Devo Bora. I'm uh, with the city of Chesapeake. Thanks to Barbara who asked questions earlier for sharing this uh, announcement. And I actually shared this announcement with an ASC committee, TMDL Analysis and Modeling Task Committee. And I'm glad to see some members uh, joining today. Dr. Padmanabhan from uh, uh, North Dakota State University has just joined. Hey, my question is to Dr. Ghosh is, uh, we have written a manual on TMDL analysis and modeling. So uh, could you point out, point us to some models that can uh, do uh, <clears throat> help develop uh, PCB TMDLs uh, so that we can use those in our manual? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. You know, uh, there are a few examples of PCB TMDLs uh, where people have, paid attention to this distinction between total loads and dissolved concentrations. But unfortunately, it's an, it's, it's an emerging uh, understanding. Mm -hmm. And I don't have one good example to give you, but uh, there are a couple of um, 
examples that go that come from the west coast uh, uh, the pacific northwest where i can i can send you a couple of key mdls that that are that people point to where um, you know for pcbs it was a more targeted effort so one of the big problems is that you know tmdls have been there for a long time and primarily focused on nutrients and sediment loads but once you go into the pcbs the the physiochemical characteristics of these chemicals make it so difficult because it's 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 a water quality problem in a very indirect way you know it's a sediment associated problem but it is also a water quality problem because water is the medium and the bioavailability aspect and the difference between suspended solid associated pcbs and the water associated pcbs is so large that it's important to take that into account and you know in the traditional tmdl framework it becomes somewhat difficult to do so that's that's the challenge but i'll point to point you separately and i'll probably uh, uh, send send along a few links to people to share excellent yeah. very good yeah i'll be talking to you thanks yeah. yeah that would be great i'm going to put together a like a dropbox or something cuz you have already sent me the the report for the Anacostia and we can have these slides. And so we can kind of put a little drop box together and send out to everybody. Um, I wanted to ask about atmospheric deposition real quick. You know, you were talking about your passive samplers. Is that not the same thing as, as being able to estimate atmospheric deposition? Cause in your box model, you showed kind of, you know, a question mark. So yeah, yeah, I'm just curious I, about that component. Yeah, I, I went too fast on that part. Um, so there are there are two major components of atmospheric or I should say three components of atmospheric depth exchange. So one is the diffusive exchange, which is happening at a molecular level, molecules of PCBs going from is it just me? Some PCBs collected from the atmosphere that drops into the river, right? So that's rain associated, it's called wet deposition. And then we also have dry deposition, that is dust contaminated with PCBs falling into the water. So some of the past work has shown that this wet deposition directly into the river and the dry deposition directly into the river are really small compared to the uh, diffusive exchange that happens continuously over a long period of time. So our focus was the diffusive exchange. So I measured the gas phase concentration, measured the freely dissolved water phase concentration, and then you have to put it into a model, mass transfer model, which estimates the mass transfer coefficient based on typical wind velocities, and then estimates the actual exchange in flux, that is, you know, nanograms per square meter per day or you know, some unit like that but that is the you know that's the diffusive exchange but then the, there is also this component of wet and dry deposition which we are actually planning to do now uh, just to put a number on it but typically that number is much much smaller about an order of magnitude smaller than the gas phase exchange so we didn't prioritize those uh, in, in our work yet Okay, so there's basically, there's not a lot of data yet, though, on that, that diffuse exchange. For Anacostia, the, uh, there, there was none. There has been some work done by uh, Joel Baker uh, 20 years ago in the Chesapeake Bay. There are some numbers for Chesapeake Bay. There, has, there are some numbers in Hudson River. Um, there's a lot of work in the San Francisco Bay. But for Anacostia, there was none. So we needed to put a number because otherwise people are putting arrows in different directions depending on what uh, uh, yeah, you have read in the past. Okay. I, I don't want to um, uh, take up people's time, but I am sure happy to entertain a couple more questions if there's any out there. Dr. Ghosh, this is Matt Fangella. I'm with the city of Suffolk. And um, has there been any research into unintended byproducts of using the activated carbon treatment? 
unintended byproducts from the treatment itself? Either the treatment or the product itself, yes. Oh, um, so as far as we know, the, uh, the treatment with the carbon or the biodegradation itself, the products get less and less toxic. So there has been no reports of any uh, unintended byproducts that are formed from that process that can be of concern. They become more and more easy to degrade as the chlorines are clipped off from the chlorinated uh, PCB. Um, you know, unlike uh, trichloroethylene or perchloroethylene, you know, you have the chance of producing vinyl chloride, which is super toxic. That's not been reported for PCBs, as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Does the activated carbon take up anything else? Oh yeah, it does. It's a it's a super absorbent for a lot of hydrophobic chemicals. So you know, it's not just picking up PCBs; it's also picking up PAHs. It's, it does great for PAHs, pesticides. Uh, dioxins. We have done some work with methyl mercury, so it's also effective for methyl mercury in absorption. Uh, PFAS compounds. Um, you know, right now the only treatment for PFAS in ground contaminated groundwater is uh, passing it through an activated carbon filter. Um, so it's a it's a wide ranging um, uh, set of chemicals that um, it can. Be effective in. For sediments, we are primarily focused on these bioaccumulative chemicals because those are the ones that uh, uh, raise concern for um, contaminated sediments. Dr. Gosh, is Justin Schaefer, City of Norfolk. Have you all looked at any uh, land application of your in situ treatments, uh, say around the perimeter of a contaminated site to eliminate groundwater contamination or? on the surface with any sort of uh, injection uh, into the ground? There, there are some technologies where um, uh, you, can, you, can, you can inject. So you do the, the particle size has to be really small to be able to be injected. And I know there are a few commercial products out there of colloidal carbon that have been used to inject into the groundwater. The question would be how much can you inject directly to be effective. The other way people have looked at it is to create barrier walls. So if the groundwater um, plume that you are concerned about uh, is, uh, you know, it can, can, can be uh, reached with a, with a trench that you can create a barrier wall in, that, that would be a way to do it. The, one of the reasons we haven't focused that much is because of the type of chemicals that we have targeted, which is polychlorinated biphenyls and PAHs, those don't travel too far in the groundwater. They're so super sticky that they tend to be more localized. But if you do have a situation where some of the lighter PCBs are making its way in the groundwater, I would like to think about some kind of a barrier wall technology. And that's certainly feasible, I think. Another question from me, you, your um, passive testing, relative cost-wise, relative to traditional PCB lab testing, what, what, what's the comparison there? So in the end, it's a traditional lab testing, but it has to be done at the congener level. So um, um, I don't have the numbers in, in, in my mind right now, but typically the congener level uh, uh, measurement that is often used for this is, uh, called EPA method 1668 and tends to be somewhere higher than $500 a sample for the analytical measurement itself, somewhere between $500 to $1,000 for the analysis itself. And then because you are putting it out in the field, oftentimes there is this, um, you know, the, the, the labor component of preparing the sampler, taking it out to the field and then retrieving it back and sending it for analysis. So, um, I don't know, it may be depending on the number of samples you are putting out. You know, if you put one sample out, it'll be super expensive. If you're putting out a hundred samples in, uh, it might cut down that 
field deployment cost and so forth. But you know, that's a bigger component uh, often than just the analytical cost. I hate to do this, but I have one more about the congeners, if that's okay. <laughs> um, do you um, link anything to the congener analysis, like the specific congeners? Are you able to do any kind of like source tracking based on specific? Yeah, yeah. So, so source tracking uh, is 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 gets really complicated with PCBs um, because the PCB congener distribution keeps changing as you go from one phase to the other. So, you know, if you have PCB twelve sixty like distribution in the original material that was released, after sixty years, it's going to look different in the field. It's going to look different in the sediments. It's going to look a whole lot different in the water phase. It'll, it's going to look very different in the air phase. And then it's also going to be different in the fish. Because, you know, some congeners are super, super volatile. Some congeners are not, they won't go into the air. Some will dissolve, some will not dissolve. Some will bioaccumulate more. So, so that's, that's something to keep in mind. But given that, if, if there are, say, for example, one, great way to be able to use that congener level data is that you have two potential sources, right? One is PCB 1242, the other is PCB 1268. You have big differences in two sources that have been um, um, identified. And then if you find something in the sediments, you can do a nice trace back of where it must have come from to give you the distribution. But oftentimes the sources are distributed, the sources get degraded over time, weathered over time, the weathering pattern becomes real difficult to trace back. But there has been some efforts in trying to do that. You have to always take it with a pinch of salt because these congener patterns keep changing. So in my mind, what is important is to be able to do a more mechanistic fate and transport model that is able to trace back the pollutants. So, you know, if trace back is, a key, is important, just chemical fingerprinting is not enough. That can be one line of evidence. But what you need beyond that is a well-developed fate and transport model that demonstrates that, yes, if something was released here, it would end up there. I don't want to keep you and everybody else on this beautiful Friday afternoon. Um, if there are no more further questions, I just really want to give my uh, greatest appreciation for Dr. Ghosh for present presenting today and answering all of our questions. Um, I certainly learned a lot. So if there's nothing further, I'm going to go ahead and stop recording and um, start gathering up all the documents and try to share as much as I can either today or expect something later next week. Thank you, everyone, and I'm happy to answer questions if you want to shoot me emails um, or any other questions that I, we could not address today. Thank you. Okay, folks, we'll have a great rest of your day and a good weekend. Bye, Thank everyone. You.